when I first called my mother, after having been the first out of four siblings to leave the safety of her first generation Haitian immigrant nest, she told me, Pitit, songez pour qui ça vient ici là, enfant, rappelle-toi pourquoi tu es là, child, remember why you are here. Lorsque j'étais jeune, ma mère m'avait montré un drôle de jeu de cache-cache. Elle cachait entre ses lèvres des mots qui n'avaient pas de mots, celles qu'elle avalait sans nous montrer l'amertume, celles qui rôdaient toujours dans sa langue, mais pas dans sa voix. Her sentence carried the familiar frequency of sacrifice. The softness of her voice reminded me of the tears she weathered that finally planted me here in uncharted opportunity where withering was a luxury I could not afford. Resilience is my mother's birthmark. It is the kind that thickens the spine of a weak spirit. It is the kind that didn't ask to be strong, yet became just enough nest for offspring. Her clay, whatever kind of grace that sustained her has found itself carved somewhere in my being. Her weary can be mistaken for weak, but rest assured, it is more noble gem than sapphire, and that's where I get my magic from. I know she's in me somewhere. My mother packed up her experiences like an overweight suitcase. Her smile had a way of convincing you that she travels light, always ready to move and bend and accommodate when necessary. After all, nomads never settle, but they do get tired. And every immigrant knows that kind of weary, that back and forth, country to country, apartment to apartment, always living in temporary housing where our mothers become our only object permanence of what home is. When you meet Nikik, Otter, listen to his jokes and chuckles and share his curiosity as he rises to the surface of the cold, clear waters of Timawawan Sagayikanik. Laugh at his jokes and remember to thank Nikik for his good humor. Speak Kitotanawa si peak. When you meet Misitak, horsefly, try to tolerate his purpose in life. When he takes a chunk of meat from under your left pinky toe, try your very best to remember your place in the community of human and deeper than human creatures. Speak, kitotanawa, si peak. When you meet Wapani Yongwe Win, East Wind, Naki, stop and listen to her tirades. Futile will be your attempt to speak over her curses. Perseverance includes a rest from your exertions and an openness to the perspective of a headlong, headstrong headwind. Is speak, Kitotanawa, si peak. When you go to meet Sipi, river, remember always to honor the memories she brings with each spring melt. Accept her invitation to journey on her waters. Be gracious and quiet as you receive her generous offerings of remembrance and wisdom. Ispi kitotanawa kanakiskawa yek Sipi. My great-grandmother sits under the shade of a cocoa tree, sweat glistening on the bridge of her nose. The seeds of an age-old language fall from her lips. A dense forest springs up at her feet. My tongue is a machete, clearing a path to find her waiting, barefoot at a bridge she has built just for me to travel the river of my becoming. I genuflect, eshe mama and we cross over. I gave myself a surprise of trees, lay back and gazed at boundless grace. I gave myself an exultant breeze that pulled me out of a lonely place. 
Chasing the bluest eyes, I ransacked the universe, searching for the one who grew up just like me. Turning hard starboard at seventh star after seventh star, I meander a map of girlish mystery. I wrote for myself a song of joy, a lyric that did not rely on someone's kiss or wandering bliss. I needed this. I needed this. I opened my eyes to a gift of rarity, an indigo studio dream, clarity. I forgave myself for crazy things, the reckless, pointless, unsure flings, the obvious dangers, the rides with strangers, the defiance needed to find one's way. I picked the lock on an unmarked door, courted risk, reward, and I demanded more. I woke, I washed, I walked, I wept. Ate seeds for three days and again I slept. A tinker, tailor, a sailor, a swine. I drank the roving minstrel's wine. I breathed in silver smoke. I married a black bird. I chase shiny things now without a word. Sometimes I glide on air. Sometimes that high freedom is impossible to bear. In the room where my father hid his most important memories, a box sat in the corner filled with my great-grandmother's pearls and silver, the items wrapped in white tissue paper and flat cotton packed away before her death, these false mementos of stature, the silver chipped, pearls flaked, still more precious than gold, treasures gifted by a husband she married while still a girl in braids, her skin darkened by the sun, hands already calloused from working the land. In the room under the stairs where my father hid these things, dust coated the walls and the boxes mother forbid us to touch. In the same room, my mother stored laundry detergent, cat litter, the good holiday ornaments. Mother would say, knowing an object is safe is more important than having it on display. Objects hold memories, you see, and father only had a few. My sister and I would wrap our necks in these remembrances when left unsupervised, or hide under the stairs, dreaming of husbands gifting us with rubies. The jewelry I own is spread haphazardly across my dresser, items found on travels to countries my great-grandmother never visited, but maybe wanted to, who knows? I never met her to ask. All my memories are wrapped in whirlwinds of adventure, all of them worth far more than the cost of a plane ride, most purchased on the side of a road. I wonder if my sons will hold them dear. I often dream of a house overlooking a valley built by my great-grandparents' hands. I dream they'd sit on the porch sharing whiskey and cigars, both covered in dust great-grandmother reserving her cleanliness for Sunday morning when God and parish paid attention. I dream of them like this, before the city moved in, when the moon hung like a cotton ball and coyotes outnumbered people and the world was small and we knew how to love each other. Behind their house now, there is an Esso station. In front, a five-story brick apartment. People's memories stacked upon each other like cardboard boxes. My great-grandmother, only ever a ghost to me, is buried in the graveyard half a mile away, her baubles still hidden under the stairs, my mother still protecting them. Girl, les filles. Third girl, slept in the middle of the other two, always older it seemed by decades, of another generation. Moi, la troisième fille, la plus jeune des grandes, je couche dans le milieu. Their maturity, like the heaviness of housework, as orderly as neat piles of office work, as sharp as paper cuts. How long is a girl a girl? Mes grandes sœurs, terre à terre, sans terre, sous des tas de tâches ménagères. Elle? Elles s'occupent des bébés. They believed in concrete, in practical, in down-to-earth. 
She lived on the thin edge of their almost not lived girlhood. Never fully children, they bore children. Un silence sourd m'étouffe. Moi, je vis sur le fil du rasoir de leur perte. How long is a girl a girl? Some girls lose girl voluntarily. Some forcibly. Some never. Some find her again in disease, when falling apart, in love. About friends, always hesitant as a camouflage spotted fawn, blending in with the colors of grasses, fallen leaves, the pungent odor of a woods floor. Moi, je me sens chez moi dans le petit bois. Je me penche sur la couche vue de la terre où je respire les odeurs du mousse, de mousse. How long is a girl a girl? She always knew she would only become elsewhere. Moi, je dois m'esquiver comme mon allié le fan, son ardente pulsion de sauter la clôture, the space and the wind and the skies. All things vast and open were her companions. Being a girl was not named, was not being someone was already having been promised. Enfoui dans le huis clos de faire famille, du compromis, absence d'un moi, d'une voix à soi. How long is a girl a girl? For this girl, escape. Pulsion de déguerpir, de partir, de décoller, de m'envoler vers le grand, grand, grand. To catch words in the wind and the skies. Anything vast and open were her chosen companions. La fille, où sont-elles passées? How long is a girl a girl? In Gujarati, I do not know how to say I am enough. Je suis assez. How I too wish I could have suspended myself indefinite. A goldfish girl forever, scales and skin iridescent, exhaling myself into the bowl that would hold enough float to breathe in the artificial sunrise, in the yellow garma, in the warmth of meeting your expectations, with the hope that I would one day build a sandcastle dream that looked so much like the nine to five of yours. A desk, a plant, a paycheck, the lifeblood of your forfeited years that mixed and cemented the house you built around us would be the only part of me that stayed anchor. So long as my tanked ambition fit into glass walls for the rest of the world to tap at, to cherish, instead I learned to suck on the sour of guilt. Jehun Rev, kum manasharam lagachev, for still I dream and I am ashamed. In Gujarati, I do not know how to say I love you. Instead, I learn it in French class, study the way it fits unspoken between my teeth. I still have yet to find it a landed home, a shelf on my wall to infuse itself with the spices scents that permeate our home. In this house, we do not know how to say I love you without an aftertaste. I wonder how I can love the coat hangers, the velarn, the rolling pins that leave no marks. I do not pass French class, but at home I master the body language of anger, of dishonor, je pour, je pour, je pour, that only a child's skin can pen. In Gujarati, avec toi, je ne parle pas d'amour with you. I do not speak of love. If I do, my lips bend unwilling and fragile, brittle with the cold, tongue scraping the fragments of a dialect you call home, like chipped ice to melt in your mouth, something that once resembled a conversation you'd fancy having with me, a daughter you wished had built herself into dreams, worth leaving a life behind for. Pourquoi tu un artiste in Gujarati je ne suis pas comme toi? I am nothing like you, dis-moi, ça valait le coup. Was it worth it? In Gujarati je suis seul. I try to wash your mother's eyes across the sink in the stained black ink water with yesterday's paintbrush runoff dreams and follow as the color once more crowds down the mouth of a drain that has seen too much of me not to taste all the salted ways that I've tried to love myself into being un fille parfait, aram dam, sari chokri, and in the rest of my empty verses and canvases blank, je suis un artiste, I write, je suis désolé, miane, mane mafkaro, I am sorry, I am sorry, I I'm sorry. What kind of woman doesn't want a child? 
The question spins like a wheel with wool in its throat is always there, the river she travels by. She negotiates the edge of Medicine Lake where water disappears mysteriously, pulled through cracks and crevices to a maze of passages underground. She bends her head back. All around, mountains spin their wheel about her, make giant statements, aleps of striated cliff. Motherhood took up all the room. Her mother at the ironing board in the summer heat, the basement apartment, the mountain of sheets and overalls to flatten and fold. The child would escape to a patch of lawn, green beyond an asphalt driveway. The island, she called it, feeling water swirl around her ankles as she forded that imaginary stream and lay down nose to nose with clover. The sweet scent of clover is floating on the wind from where to where I don't know. She strung words together, a necklace of white glow. Pennyroyal, pomegranate, bitter willow bark, those ancient charms against childbirth. The doctor, a jowled mastiff on guard, gazed at them across his dark desk. Her mother held a handbag on her knees, its gold clasp an entry to lipstick and Kleenex smelling faintly of spittle. All three equally embarrassed as she asked him to prescribe the pill for her daughter. The gift her mother wanted to procure for her, not to be carried into the clefts, not to be caught by the gloomy young boyfriend. This new freedom in a plastic dispenser a moon-round talisman guarding each day with its click. We awake nimble on fragile rungs, climbing a ladder of light, dark eyes opening to a glassy crescent moon. We stretch our arms full, tingle fingers against cruel waves of night, yearn to sleep again but step higher, two steps higher, three steps higher, Brace and breathe and breathe in again. Coil, then launch, spin, up, up, up. Night flying is the most thrilling. Night wind cool on our skin. Night vision sharp, surreal. Floating up, floating up. Feels like falling, but we float up, up, up. Glide and turn, glide and turn. We have no wings, they'd only burn. We rise and glide, envious of birds. We can't describe this joy in words. Higher, higher, imprinting lungs on fire. Of anything I've done, this is the hardest thing, to fly without wing, impossible and still effortless. The hawk cannot catch me, raven envies my sheen. Owl merely watches, thoughtful, keeping track, unseen. These flights are not limitless, ground comes hard. That's the part that needs more handling. The wise ones grin. It's not the fall that kills you, it's the landing. I aim for a sturdy branch on which to perch, to rest, breathe big again, to study what's below and that which is so far above. It's the out of reach that we most love. Night flying, so swift, so slick, without falling, that's the cleverest trick, the most Beautiful feeling. A teen girl dissects a pig's heart on a bed of stainless steel and scalpel, wonders if it could have remained alive inside a body. 
A teen girl brings a compact into the bathroom, pulls up plaid skirt, meets held breath, shaking hands, trembles something like the first lullaby that has ever traveled past her lips instead of into the cotton down folds of her childhood memories. A teen girl imagines that the universe is made of the starlight's possibility to live beyond its own lifetime and still keep entire species warm throughout theirs. A teen girl fears nothing that her body expels, for she too is a natural exorcist, purging the last remembrances of leaving men in a two-fingered salute. Everyone who has reached inside of her has burned the tips of their fingers, black and crisp and wet and saucy, and who hasn't tasted herself, licked name from her palms lifeline to heart and spit up nothing but an answered prayer rolled a tongue around the dark maroon of a stained jaw as she taught herself the curvature of her own story, how to hold queendom between her thighs and have it weigh nothing and everything all at once. And when they ask her why she sings to nine planets instead of eight, she responds that labels are for fishermen who make a living gutting on the same wharf they once dived off. And what is a love song if not the opposite of gravity? What is she if not something that is luminous in the night, ice burning despite the maps she's been scorched from? The solar system has room enough for weak ankles and gapless columns of flesh that hold up a seeping stomach that bulges in the name of her own excess. And at 27, when she asks if the black silk garters come in 2X, what she is trying to say is that you cannot call it a pig if you refuse to touch anything but its heart. An animal needs nothing of hope to still hold her neck like there is nothing that can take her down easy. For T, because you bear a burden so much bigger than you. Sacred stone ground down from boulder, your life begins a grain of sand, a child of stone. You are older than even ragged peaks where rough pines stand. Spirit rock, you are tenacious, holding firm to your soul's fire. Child, your fight for life is a courageous plea to free a right defiled. Stone child, you are a flint's quick spark, your life infused in fire water, uneasy waters as you start, rising, falling, pebble daughter. Granite spirit, let your sacred force rise high like steam from rock's hot spine. Put out the blaze of brewer's curse. Extend your reach past peaks and pines. Make of your life a love. Make of this place a viable dream because the moon, because the valley, because the banks, because the river. On the skin of the water, the shimmering, the silver, they came. The moon recites all the rhythms, recycles, recycles, remembers. On the path of the shimmering, the silver, on the skin of the water they came. Because the river carries and drifts, because the banks settled and shifted, because the valley carved, called, ils sont venus. Sur la voie argentée de la lune, encore et encore, ils viennent, ils viendront. La lune bat le rappel, bat le rappel, bat le rappel because of the moon, because of the valley, because of the banks, because of the river, the skin of the water, the shimmering, the silver. We have come. Make of this place a viable dream. Make of your life a love. Make of your life a love. Make of this place a viable dream. À cause de la voie argentée de la lune, à cause de la rivière, de la rive, de la vallée qui se souvient, qui se souvient, la lune bat le rappel, bat le rappel, bat le rappel. Encore et encore, ils viennent, ils viendront. Ils sont venus sur la voie argentée de la lune. Because the valley carved called, because the banks settle and shift, because the river carries and drifts. On the skin of the water they came, on the path of the shimmering, the silver, remembering, recycling, recycling, reciting all the rhythms, 
the moon, the shimmering, the silver, they came on the skin of the water, the river, the banks, the valley, the moon. Make of this place a viable dream. Make of your life a love. What kind of woman? One who wanted the decision over with. A floating world, Demerol nibbling in her veins, Two snips with a laser, and she'll be free from the monthly fear that jerks her to heal over and over. Incandescent lights flare from the ceiling as the gurney rolls her to the surgeon's scalpel-tipped incredulity. Are you certain you want to go through with this? What is ever certain? She dreams. She is bleeding the syrup of monthly blood. As she wipes it away, she sees a tiny creature in her palm. It is struggling to get away. It is afraid of her. Daughter, grief beats in her chest like a child's wail. She cannot put the fetus back. She cannot throw it away. This pain sucks the breath out of her lungs. This pain must lie in the bed she has made. You have no maternal instincts, one man lashed at her. Where does an instinct go? Why did it not thicken into flesh, like breasts, like thighs, start circulating its low current Month in, month out. She thought they only wanted somewhere to park their jeans, somewhere to scatter their toys, another kid to play with, while the great caring, washing, feeding, many-armed, fiercely juggling mother minded the details. She might have been kinder. She did not know how deep the need to be a father can dig into a man, a spiral wound into his cells, tugging at him. How much he needs to take part in what came before, in what goes on, the seeping of Generation after generation, the stream that runs over the cliff of life and on into darkness. In the photograph, his arm is draped over her shoulder. He wears the arrogance of his youth, a smile that shows he has everything, even the girl they said he could not have, and your mother is glowing like she knows it too. And you want to dive into her open mouth and hear her voice before the children, before the baggage and the journey across the world that nearly broke their backs. No one could have told her then there was anything bigger than this love, that she would spend the rest of her life chasing this moment. The woman in the photograph would have laughed at the idea that she would one day have a daughter for each finger on her hand that each one would point an accusation, and one would rot clean off the bone, choose a severing so complete, the sound of her heart breaking would echo across generations. Beloved, you've grown so accustomed to the sound of your own inner critic that you've forgotten the sacredness of your name, not the one your mother chose to give you. Not the one they butchered, 
Not the easier version you gave them to make them more comfortable, but the sacred one, the name injected with God's breath. Beloved, this city you know nothing of will become your unwanted chisel and hammer. Your tear ducts will grow tired of exposing their anguish. Your back will grow tired of bending over to afford other people's expectations. Healing will appear to be playing a cruel game of hide and seek, and you will tiptoe on the edge of the LRT train line because despair will advise you to choose death instead. Remember your maker. Remember the fog eventually clears. The sun eventually exposes God's mercy onto Earth's celestial roof to remind us of the grace that still sustains our lungs. I was born with canoe on my shoulder, snow in my spleen, born in nest of maple, shimmery. Crows and magpies fought over me, squawking. There was a blackish purple rhythm to it. I was born between the red swing and the Virginia reel, beside the fish in the crotch of the tallest tree, born mostly pink skinned but with scorch marks on the tops of my feet and bells where my ears should have been. I was born on a cold St. Andrew's windy white day under the felt, inside the lining of the hat box, the color of cummerbund and the non-color of my grandmother's madness. I was born not quite right in the head, nor was I quite wrong, mostly just quiet and a bit sad. I was not born of the wind or the sparrow, but of scotch pine and caribou, Lapland reindeer if you want to get specific. Born brown-haired in a tribe of blonde warriors. Born single-hearted, but perennially love divided. Born of thistle and tartan, I knew how to swing an ax and swim, swim, swim. I was born without voice, more a vague sort of hum. Born not bear, but wildcat. Born not quite rabbit, not quite raven, but with complete understanding of the trickster mystique. I was born on the cusp of falling, falling. Born into twilight and gospel and wet. Born missing the sway and the swirl, set apart from the greening fern heavens. Born into the swaddle and the feral sweater. Born into love, and love was born into me. I was born, and you may believe this or not, with a full head of salt and both wings and gills and great gasping lungs that still hunger for true, honest air. My arrival did not make the papers, though my chickety eyes were a pretty big deal. I was a mute girl child born at a fury and cedar and flame, bred to be the bride of winter. But my heart chose a riverboat gambler she taught me to spin, spin, spin. I taught myself to sound. One, airport. After misreading my boarding pass, ending up deep in the entrails of the airport, in the refugee corner, a half-smiling officer redirects me toward the mass of humanity waiting at my gate where my heart opens raw and sharp like teeth. Two, on board, the usual bilingual spiel as we taxi toward the last winter task before flight, de-icing, a strange quiet moment where in the steady sound of the motor's hum, the hush of green suds spray, I feel the placental tug of detachment the calm of after storm. Three, stuck. The day after a record snowfall in Montreal, feeling like he could crack, the women figure out how to create traction with cardboard boxes and car mats. So the front wheels of stuck stop digging themselves deeper and deeper. The way the women hold the calm shovel, shovel on this last perfect and frayed holy night their every joint locked in place, holding together the brilliant mechanisms of their body, mine recalibrating to the miraculous approach of a late birthing, not quite as incredulous as old Sarah's of the Bible, yet again the impending break at the frothing brute gate of birth, 
the great cave of its continuance, the inevitable parting of the waters, each moment of crowning through the wreckage of tearing open of the blood, the vernix, the head, shoulders, torsos, and arms, and legs dangling of beings bright burning in the throat, each birth a miracle. Out, women, out! Get out of the way, Christ Almighty! L'homme au volant prend son air d'aller, backs up the goddamn black VW, revs up the fucking motor to the max, and lets fly straight out over the snow. Echoes of the cock's first crow. Nimikwa titi man. Let's go to the great gathering place. Etote tan kitse mamwe ba yuwenik. Come, I'll take you in my big red canoe. There, on the other shore, we'll meet our friends and relatives, and we'll visit and talk for hours and days, just as the breeze and the leaves talk for hours and days. Only after we thank the grandfathers, sky and buffalo, and the grandmothers, river and antelope, and our cousins, moose and sturgeon. Will we build a fire and feast on the riches of this great gathering place in between? We'll thank river and we'll thank fire Iskotel for giving us life here at this great gathering place. With the North Shore joined to the South Shore by the life-giving waters of Kisiskatsuwan CP, we'll talk of good things and bad. We'll celebrate and solve problems. We may even agree to disagree, but let's always be gentle. Yoskatisitan. Let's always be generous. Zawei matanik. Let's always be kind. Kise watisitan. And let's always love. Sakehewetan. Our friends and relatives. As we revere river, as we revere fire, for giving us life. Come, let's go to the great gathering place. Astam. Etote tan kitsi mamuwe ba yu anik. I'll take you there in my big red canoe. Kika kapateta dinawao nime kwati tima nik. Chronic disappointments have a way of causing the heart to become joy shy. When this well of life becomes too shy to approach, it tiptoes around any semblance of bliss, convinced of its fickle. Sometimes it will make you envy the way others pronounce gladness in their bodies with such ease. But here are five things to do when you feel a long way from spelling out your own victory. One, let the tears erupt if it so chooses. Embrace the range of your own clouds, mist and flood breed harvest. Two, weep. Purge the anguish. Weary hearts need release. In the words of Mary Kondo, never discard anything without saying thank you and goodbye. Three, breathe. <sighs> Fully without holding any possibility of another agony to fall on your head. Four, close your eyes. Sight make poor pupils when it learns from a heavy heart. Five, consider the mercy found in the sun's capacity to set in all its hues. If she can still rise, then so will you. Woman I did not birth, be a nasty woman. Loud voiced, gut laughing deep in the belly, 
Let secrets spill like splashes of indigo pouring down chins. Spread your legs wide. Take up two seats. You whiskey drinking, private club hijacking, shorn head, hairy armpits, you fucking goddess. Tell someone. Trauma will bury itself inside your skin like prison bars because you are brilliant. Because the name you wore to Sunday school is not your name. Woman, I did not birth, be colossal. Take up space, take up knitting or boxing, take up with the circus and a woman with tattoos of women in bikinis on her arms, backpack through Nepal or Brooklyn, paint scenes of kink or puppies on the back of your lovers, eat well and often. Gorge yourself on grapefruit and avocado, on dark chocolate and medium rare steak. Spray whipped cream down your pink panties. Marry the farmer because he knows how to handle a bull. Or the girl in Bali because her kiss felt like scripture. You are scripture. You radical introvert. You fire-breathing dragon. Listen to Janelle Monet or Florence and the Machine while dancing naked for your lovers, all of them. Say your name, say your name, say your name, all of them. Woman I did not birth, do not walk lightly. Be heavy footed, heavy handed, be dirty. Let them try and tell you to clean your mouth, to clean your house. Strength will be required of you. Let them try and tell you how to grieve, how to love, how to hold on to living, what being a woman is. What kind of woman does not want a child? There is something she wants to claim, something she touches cautiously, as if laying fingers to the pulse at her own wrist, not believing she can call it hers. There is a story she has heard. On the ancient road to Thespiae, a young man fell asleep in the time-drugged summer in the droning heat. Bees plastered his lips with wax, dubbed him poet by divine anointment. Pindar filled with fame like a hive with honey. There was another who found words sweet and round to the tongue a kinswoman of the famous poet who followed his work from the shadows all her life, who spoke his odes over and over until she could draw each line down smooth as wool from her spindle. In old age, pillowed now on darkness, Pindar dreamed that he stood in the shade of willows by Persephone's sacred pool. The maiden rebuked him. Of all the gods, you have neglected only me. You devise no anthem in my name, no dithyram to praise my courage when the Styx clasped with its cold stream my trim ankles. But it was too late to write this final ode, to fill the silence for the pale queen. Pindar died not ten days later. It was his old kinswoman who dreamed the poet came to her and murmured words from the underworld, who woke and wrote them down. This is what she desires. Though still it seems presumptuous to turn away from the mountain and leave its work to others. She wants to become that old woman, filling in what has been left blank, going into the mystery of unexplored caves and returning with flowers. Her mother, now mysteriously old, says, having children wasn't quite enough. 
Mountains in the rearview mirror. Wait in the grave, soft curtained twilight, like a tent of hosts at a window, raising an arm in farewell. I had the highway and the ache of leaving them behind. What kind of woman does not want a child? A heart beating enormously, a purse opened to pay the price, an accident of landscape, a river that sinks into its stone bed, emerges somewhere else. Fat girl tweets about pussy like she has one, like she's sure she's seen it shatter, once a stained glass, once a portrait of a lady raining down on her like the walls of Notre Dame. Fat girl thinks her pussy looks better than anything Kanye could have described, like it's worth more than a scratch on an overhyped record. Fat girl has seen it in the mirror and not just the internet, knows its name and what country it comes from, which is to say that it belongs to nothing but the dirt, from the soaked brown earth, from the clenching of stomach and grin of a good woman, the kind that does not know her place. Fat girl tweets about pussy like she does not know her place, like it has an opinion and all the plastic she shoved into it, like her pussy is yet another ocean. Fat girl tweets about pussy like she's raised it herself, taught it to braid its hair and say please, sit quietly at recess, pull on nothing that is attached to the head of another person, fight back with multiplication tables and math scores instead of her fists, tweets about pussy like it once finger painted itself directly onto the floor, into a bloody sunset or a car crash like its very existence once planted its flag on a white couch and salted the earth around it, Fat girl tweets about pussy like she used her mother's minimum wage to buy it a seat at the table. Fat girl takes up a whole seat at the table, gets stared at by fat men who have the audacity to ask her to lean back, to stand up and move, to breathe more shallow around them, like white is worth more than dark meat, like their metaphors have always been ready to consume her and still ask her to say thank you, ask her to move all that pussy, to close her legs and walk away so their sons can step on the bones she leaves in her wake and sell the sound of cracking spines to a symphony. Fat girl's pussy is the symphony. Fat girl tweets about pussy like she isn't one, and the men question if she even has one, hidden the origami of her thickness, have to reach beneath her, crook their fingers on her latch, check if she is still breathing or just holding back. How dare she hide that pussy? Is that pussy well-trained? Is that pussy going to behave? Is that pussy a man's best friend? Kneel, roll over, who's a good girl now? Fat girl tweets about pussy because she has to, because sometimes she reaches beneath her skirt and comes up empty-handed. Because if you put her pussy in a box and ask her to walk it home alone, she is not sure if she will end up dead or asking for it. Fat girl tweets about pussy like she has a choice to be licked to the bone, grated to the marrow, sucked and fondled and rubbed raw of everything that makes her whole. Fat girl tweets about pussy because this time she means it. This time when she says no, you will hear it and listen. This time you will understand that the universe makes mistakes and they sound exactly like your name. Fat girl tweets about pussy and none of the men who slide into her DMs walk away with their self-destructive hunger intact because fat girl and her pussy refuse to be called dessert any longer. Fat girl tweets about pussy and it exceeds the word limit has too much character, too little flaws, could start a religion if she wanted it. Fat girl tweets about pussy over and over again, grips it with two hands, plays house between her legs until coming down feels like coming home to cathedrals, dripping with Elmer's glue and war paint built to the sound of the first time her mother ever said her name. This is a love letter to my sisters, one I should have written long ago. I remember the sky blue Pontiac and the boy in the back seat. 
I remember the girl who refused to let me get in the car. I remember the Motley Crue concert and the tequila. I remember the boy and the empty staircase, the dirt and dust in the corner. I remember the sounds of female laughter in the hallway before it was too late. I remember being the skinny girl with no boobs and the curvy girl with big boobs and the MILF. I remember being 15 and let into the banger bar. I remember back alleys, groping hands and cigarette smoke breath. I remember secret signals we thought up. I remember checking in, being the voice of reason and not being street smart and wanting to be wanted, I remember pretending to be asleep. Sexual assault is defined as A, an act in which a person intentionally, sexually touches another person without that person's consent or coerces or physically forces a person to engage in a sexual act against their will. B, an assault committed in circumstances of a sexual nature such that the sexual integrity of the victim is violated. C, illegal sexual contact that usually enforces upon a person without consent or is inflicted upon a person who is incapable of giving consent as because of age or physical or mental incapacity or who places the assailant, such as a doctor, in a position of trust or authority. The synonyms for sexual assault are A, assault, B, rape, C, ravishment, D, violation. This is a love letter to my sisters, all the ones I do not know, all the ones who understand why we don't walk alone at night who raise their hands and say, stop, you don't have to explain, girl. I know, I believe you first. I don't question why you walked into the room, why you let him kiss you that way, but refuse that way. I get it, we get it, we know. You've got to deny, 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 and push back on these women. If you admit to anything, any culpability, then you're dead. You've got to be strong. You've got to be aggressive. You've got to push back hard. You've got to deny anything that's said about you. Never admit. I've seen a close-up of her chest and a lot of freckles. Are you into freckles? She's probably deeply troubled and therefore great in bed. How come the deeply troubled women, deeply, deeply troubled, they're always the best in bed? Look at that face. Would anybody vote for that? Can you imagine that? The face of our next president? I mean, she's a woman. And I'm not supposed to say bad things, but really, folks, come on. Are you serious? I just start kissing them. It's like a magnet, just kiss. I don't even wait. And when you're a star, they let you do it. You can do anything. Grab them by the pussy. You can do anything. Such a nasty woman. Nearly one million girls are trafficked across international borders as sex slaves every year. They're still burning us at the fucking stake. This is a love letter to my sisters. One I should have written long ago. I still remember the boy in the sky blue Pontiac. I still remember the boy who thought I was asleep. As much as I wish to, the president said, I cannot promise that we can find them. They converted to Islam, married off to the fighters, Abu Bakr Shakao said. They were taken across the border into Cameroon, witnesses said. A negotiator told us at least three died in the early days from a snake bite, malaria, and dysentery. I am outraged and heartbroken. Michelle Obama posted a picture of herself holding a sign, please know this, Malala Yousafzai wrote, we will never forget you. 
Years pass without a whisper from the girls. My father's gun in the upstairs window will shoot its first and only shot when I am 10. And the armed robbers come, rattling our gates like rabid dogs. My sisters and I huddled in our nightgowns on his bedroom floor. We have to leave this country, he whispers to my mother, his finger trembling on the trigger. That night, my father will almost kill a man to protect our childhood. He will never say the words, I love you. But in the chamber of his heart is one loaded bullet. Midnight at the water's edge, blessing and 3,000 refugees wade in, silent and barefoot they fall into the sea. Soon, most will wash back ashore with no names to call but the numbers scribbled on their clothes for weeks. The smugglers' telephones on the other side, silent. No one to answer for the girls with skin like rich palm oil, bloodying the water. They built fences in Morocco, paid the nations on the coastline to keep the teeming bodies back. Tomorrow, Europe might no longer be European, said Gaddafi. We'll use human beings as weapons, cram the black bodies into fishing trawlers, launch them from Libya into the sea. The ungovernable, the slaves, the concubines, and the prostitutes burn it to the ground. Swift flowing river, snakes its way through the heart of Edmonton to lay still in the winter of our arrival. Our hands turn white, the air like shards of glass to our faces that night. Our family shares a pizza on our basement apartment. Then we fall asleep, three on the bed, three on the floor, our bellies bloated with hope. We tread water for 20 winters between our yesterdays and the tomorrow we were promised. Everything here is borrowed or stolen, the language, the land, my own body far flung. I lose my old English, my tongue twice colonized. All the women I know are running toward or away, and everything I know of disappearance begins with water, the girls. Their thirsty mouths open skyward, rainwater muddying the forest floor. The six-month ocean crossing that pulls the salt from our skin, the dam, breaking inside my mother. The first blood sacrifice that pulled me from one world into the next began inside a woman, sliced down the middle so another woman could emerge whole. All I know of magic making and survival I learnt at birth. I want to defend my country. Which one? I mythologize my grandmother. I write stories about warrior women with thunder between their thighs. Then the girls disappear, and no one goes looking. I ask my mother the Yoruba word for shame. Do you know they only drank water when it rained? What kind of country does nothing when 200 girls disappear? A thousand indigenous women stop in their tracks to crane their necks back in unison. Tears flood the highway till even the rivers overflow. The girls had disappeared for three weeks before we knew their names. Then we spoke them, 276 in Chibok, but thousands more missing and murdered across the country answered. It is customary to wait seven days to name a child, touch her lips with water, and palm oil, honey, and salt, cola. Give her a taste of the bitter and the sweet, the joy and the pain. Pray for her, a spirit with the resilience of water. All of this just to say, stay. <laughs>